Hi, everyone. Welcome to our last Icology Presents of the year, which is wild to think. Uh, I'm Kristen Hancock. My pronouns are she and her. I am extra excited to do this Icology Presents because fundraising and philanthropy has, has it was actually how my career started. Uh, I, my very first full-time big girl job out of college was at Ronald McDonald House, and it fostered a love of fundraising and all things philanthropy. I will also say it taught me that I don't want to be a professional fundraiser for a living. So that's where I ended up in internal comms. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm going to bring our panelists on the screen because they're all amazing, awesome philanthropy people. Hello to Ed, to Becky, to Jeremy. Hi, everyone. We've got a decent little like geographic circle here covered. I'm in Indianapolis. Uh, Becky, you're in North Carolina. That's right. And Ed, you're in California. That's right, Bay Area. And Jeremy's in the great city of Columbus, Ohio. So it doesn't get much better than that. Would that love to know, would love to know where people are joining us from. That's always the most interesting part of the beginning here is finding out where everyone's joining us from. Uh, so actually let's do where you're from. And I would also love to know everyone's favorite charity. So when you pop, pop into the comments, let us know what your favorite charity is, where you're joining us from. Uh, it is not lost on any of us that tomorrow is giving Tuesday. So of course we know today is Cyber Monday. Did anyone get, did any of you get any decent Cyber Monday deals? Not yeah. yet, but today's young. <laughs> <laughs> well, since nope. Black Friday and Cyber Monday pretty much starts like the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, my wife talked me into a Pac-Man cocktail table, which we totally got buyer's remorse afterwards and we've tried to return it, but we can't. So that's probably the biggest thing we splurred on. I wonder why you got buyer's remorse <laughs> after buying a pac -Man. We have no place to put it. I don't know where it's going to go. I see some space right behind you. It looks like you've got just a little bit of uh, room. <laughs> there you go. A little cocktail table in the with Pac-Man. That's, that's, amazing and ridiculous that's almost like a white what do they call white elephant gift or something where you find something totally ridiculous to give to mm -hmm. someone that's really yeah. funny well i would suggest anyone who is uh considering a similar type of purchase on cyber monday maybe and ed you know what you can disagree with me if you want maybe it's a better idea to put that into a nonprofit organization possibly <laughs> so much better that's that's such a better idea <laughs> So Erica is joining us today from Central Arkansas. Hello, Erica. Uh, she loves a local nonprofit called Make Do. Now I want to know more about Make Do. So Erica, feel free to give us a little background and also still loves Heifer International. That's really cool. I think um, it's, it's an interesting mix. I'm sure all of us have examples of very local grassroots organizations and then also the, the big nonprofits, right? The, the, the large names um, to support. So it's always good to have a mix of those things, I think, as well. Now, I, uh, we all know, everyone on this call for sure knows that internal comms intersects with corporate philanthropy very often. I think many of us are tasked with either taking care of it entirely or working closely with uh, the teams that are organizations that take on. Um, so let's do let's do a little panelist intro now that we're getting people to say their intros as well. So I will let each of you do your own. Let everyone know who and where you, well, who, who you are, where you are, uh, your current role, and then I would love to know your favorite charity. So Ed, why don't you go first? Yeah, hi everyone, uh, Ed McClendon here. I am the Senior com and Internal Communications Manager at Early Warning. Um, we're a FinTech company owned by the seven, seven of the largest banks uh, in the United States. Um, I'm based in the Bay Area. Um, I try not to say the San Francisco Bay Area because I'm from Oakland, the, the city on the other side of the Bay. Um, and currently my favorite charity is Movember. Um, if you could see, I'm doing my best to grow a mustache. This is the first time I'm um, doing it in my entire life, but Movember is a global organization that encourages men to grow a mustache in the month of November, um, all in the goal of raising awareness about mental health for men, um, prostate cancer, um, suicide, things like that. So um, that's my favorite charity as of this moment, but I do have a list of other charities that I can definitely go into later on. I love it. And are you, when do you get to, are you going to keep the mustache? 
I I might. I, I like I might keep it for a while. I have like a little mini brush that I've been using <laughs> each day and it tangles and it hurts. I mean, it hurts so bad when it tangles, but I don't know, it's different. I've had okay. the same look my entire life. So okay. why not try something new in my forties? Okay. Okay. Oh, here we've got a comment from everyone's favorite troublemaker, Chuck Ghost. Jeremy has a head start on Movember. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> that is it has the head start on the cocktail table, though. So we you know, right. <laughs> trying new things. <laughs> on that note, Jeremy, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, happy to. Hi, everyone. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much for having me uh, and including me in the conversation. Jeremy Ball uh, with Big Lots and the Big Lots Foundation. We're a Fortune 500 retailer, stores in 47 states, uh, 40,000 associates at our peak throughout the year. My role here, uh, I have an amazing opportunity to lead a wonderful team of people. Uh, who are charged with creating and curating culture. Uh, and so we have responsibility for internal communications, uh, which often bleeds into some of the external PR as it relates to um, the community piece of it. We have the foundation, all of philanthropy, which includes the Big Lots Foundation, all of our investments across the country, all the associates that are empowered to give, but also uh, what we do in store for causes and raising awareness and money from the customer as well. And then finally, the third piece of that uh, in this, this sort of perch is our major event production. So we took a look at all this and said, we're going to pull all this together, focus on culture uh, because of the interconnectedness. So today's conversation is perfect for that. Uh, raise your hand if you're a big billionaire. <laughs> big deal. To it. Yeah, our campaign. By the way, my favorite charity uh, is one called On Our Sleeves. Okay. On Our Sleeves.org. You can find it there. Uh, really, our company's um, primary or most significant focus is helping children with mental health illnesses. And so we know that the sooner uh, that children can uh, have intervention uh, for mental health uh, challenges or maladies, the better off their life will be. Uh, there's so much research that backs that, but I'll just wrap it up and say on our sleeves is the idea that kids don't wear their emotions on their sleeves. So we need to start the conversation around mental health uh, and having those positive, constructive conversations so that we learn to deal with mental health in a very constructive and positive way. I see so many uh, and hear about so from friends who have kids and schools and everything that the way that kids now are taught to talk about emotions is remarkable. I think it's life changing, and it's it's I, I'm I'm sure that organizations like that have a direct link to those kinds of things. Absolutely. Yeah. So Absolutely. that's really, and cool. it's a different day. I mean, the, when I was a kid, we didn't, my family did, but beyond that, our society, we're taught to not talk about emotions or difficult things, Absolutely. Uh, but to suppress those, but this is the much more uh, productive way to do that. So, well, we're all going to talk about our feelings today. I love it. It's my favorite kind of conversation. Last, but absolutely not least Becky. Yeah. Hey everyone. Again, um, thank you. Uh, Kristen, for having me. I am Becky Graby. I lead employee communications at SAS in Cary, North Carolina. It's an AI and business analytics company that's been around uh, over 40 years. So um, my role here is to lead employee communications. I'm part of a larger integrated comms team. So to Jeremy's point, we are also thinking about what we do that will allow people to speak in positive and impactful ways um, out on social. So, you know, we're thinking through the whole, the whole nine yards now, which is a little bit different. Um, man, it's really hard to narrow down one specific, um, charitable organization, but I'll probably go with one that I've sponsored and, and been a part of for many, many years, a uh, um, an organization called Zoe empowers, which, um, helps children who are orphaned in Africa, India, Guatemala, lots of different countries out of that, um, orphan type environment brings them together to form a new community and takes them from poverty to entrepreneurship and helps them be successful heads of households. It's a really incredible program. So it's a very unique program. I like that. That's very cool. Um, Zane is joining us. Zane is in Florida now. Uh, junior achievement, helping kids in tough schools and neighborhoods see there are more opportunity in the world than they might think. And I gives you a whole new appreciation for teachers. I can, only imagine that the last couple of years and that new appreciation. So that's really cool. That's a great, I don't think I, I knew the name junior achievement. I'm not sure I really knew a lot about what they were about. So that's really interesting. And Erica's got uh, an update for us. Okay. Make do is a studio where the director develops classes, watercolors, hand lettering, et cetera, for youth and adults to be 
create full. Oh, that's great. And create beautiful things. I love that. That's a really cool little organization. All the cool stuff here today. Um, okay, so I want to get started. Well, actually, I have a little trivia thing first that no one knew I was going to talk about. The title of this live stream event is called The Heart of It All. There is one person on this call who should know what that is in reference to. You know it. Good. What's the reference? Well, I, I, maybe it's outdated. I don't know, but it's been the tagline for the state of Ohio, like the tourism for, I mean, I grew, I grew up in Ohio, so that's, that's, yes. but yeah, there you go. Okay. So it is, and you're correct. It is no longer the current theme. Every time we draw, I know it's, that's, that's why I used it because I think it's such a great theme and they don't use it anymore. What every time it? we, so Chuck's family's in Ohio. Every time we drive to Ohio, we pass this big arch thing that says welcome to Ohio yeah. and then it used to say the heart of it all right. which is cute because the state kind of is like a little heart shape like yeah. right. now it says oh, Ohio it find it here find yeah it here. find it here mm. I know mm. anyway and I don't, well, don't <laughs> tell the people that the government, but I don't think it quite fits I don't think you can find it all here but <laughs> I can't make a judgment call on that I'm gonna get deported so I'll let I'll let the Americans make the calls on that one <laughs> So let's talk, we, a couple of you mentioned this integrated um, concept. So I'd love to know, um, and Becky, maybe you can start off. What what does the structure of internal comms and corporate giving look like at SAS and how integrated are they? I, I would say that it's a combination of, of folks that are, that are pulling this together and kind of creating this little microcosm. So it's it's owned by a philanthropy team. So someone who is overseeing corporate giving and and both at the individual and the and the corporate level. So then we also have a, a team of folks in HR that are in employee engagement. So they are the, you know, they're kind of helping to think through what some of the activations might be around some of our direction. And then internal comms, of course, is helping to promote, inspire people to get involved, learn their stories and help elevate what's coming out of the different activations and things that people are doing, making sure that they understand what the guidelines are around each one of the, the programs and that type of thing. So yeah, it's a, it's a combined effort for sure. I think I, internal comms just has that role of, you know, like anything else that we do that we really want to get across to colleagues. It's what, what, it, what would inspire you to be a part of this? Where are the stories that we want to tell? It still requires all those elements, right? It still requires video and imagery and all the things that make it fly. So uh, collaborative effort. And, and Jeremy and Ed, would you say that that is similar in your organizations or does it look different for you? Slightly different on our end, but maybe similar. Um, by default, there's a natural integration with internal communications. And that's because I was on the community impact team, which is our team that really drives everything. Um, though it is is uh, led by our um, our people team, our human resource team, they, they really oversee everything. But since you know, like most internal comms people, um, I have control issues. I have to find my way on <laughs> to every organization because I figured they're going to come to me anyway. So why do I just like be a part of it and have somewhat of a say in the decision making that happens along the way? But that that's really like our struggle, um, our um, structure is there's integration because I'm a part of the team and it's a very important thing. So I'm not joining it for selfish reasons. I'm joining it because kind of that. And then also, I think it's an important thing to do. Love that. I, you know, I, I love it because each one of these is building on each other, right? The interconnectedness. And I think I shared in the setup that that is our team, right? It's communications, philanthropy and events. And by the way, events is both communications and philanthropy. Philanthropy is events and communicate, you know, it's, it's all of it fits together and we have no choice. We've got a small team. We're five full-time people. Um, and everyone is cross-trained, uh, so everyone can support each other, but there is a by title and responsibility lead in each one of those areas. But we also, when we look for talent on this team, we're specific about how, you know, what is your interest? What is, what is maybe the entrepreneurial spirit you have or the curiosity you have around what other things do you want to learn and add to your own skill set? So when I hire someone who is in comms, I'm first looking for creativity um, and that curiosity, but then the ability, you know, to then say, yeah, I can lend a hand on event day, we all become event people. And when we need, you know, a pulse or, you know, we have a, a temple moment in communications, we kind of shift and 
people are focused on communication. Same thing with, you know, uh, major events, uh, philanthropy, et cetera. We all become whatever the, the, the you know, the biggest point or the, the feature of the week is. Um, so it just works incredibly well. And Jeremy, do you have, does Big Lots have a very clear um, corporate philanthropy cause organization, whatever, or plural? Yes. So uh, we have the Big Lots Foundation, uh, which we established in 2015. Actually, it's not been around that long, but it's done some pretty incredible things. Uh, so that's interesting. I'm a quick poll. Sorry to interrupt you. Ed and Becky, does Early Warning or SAS have their own foundation? We do not know. Okay, I just think that's a really unique um, element that you mentioned. Sorry, Jeremy, to interrupt you. I just want to jump. No, on that's that. okay. And it's very common that companies give from the company, like the corporation. Um, uh, plenty of others also give from the corporation and have a foundation or some combination of that. Um, so all of those, by the way, in whatever way you do it, doing good is the right thing. So um, it makes sense. Um, our our focus is for really four impact areas: is healthcare, fighting hunger, um, housing and supporting uh, education. So that is the focus done within the greater umbrella of uh, the foundation. Yeah. And Ed, do you, Ed and Becky, I'll, I'll go to both of you just to find out too, do you have very clear corporate um, causes that you support? Currently, no, but I know that's something that's a big focus for 2023. Um, a couple years ago, we revamped our company values and one core part of the value is serving the greater good. And our community. So I think it's it's taken us maybe a year or two to really understand what that is. But now, like coming into year three, we're very laser laser focused as a company on like these are the um, the different initiatives and charities that we're really focused on. So instead of maybe having um, different focuses all over the place, like let's just like be laser focused on like the things that we think are really impactful and that connects to our company values and our core values. Mm -hmm. And for SAS, um, our main focus is education. So right now there's a big push around uh, data for good, data literacy, uh, STEM, that type of thing. So that's definitely our focus. It's interesting that we mentioned that. So we did, um, I would love to know for people joining us if your uh, organization has a cause or a specific organization that you support, um, or if you do not and you're wondering where to get started, that would also be good good to, for us to know too. We can walk you through it. Um, one of the things we did last week, was it last week? Yes. The What is time anymore? The days are all blurring <laughs> together. Uh, we had a, a session inside Ecology called Beyond, Beyond Internal Comms. We try and do it once a month where we bring in an expert from an outside area. And this month we had a fundraising expert on. And one of the things he mentioned was how important it is um, for companies to have a cause, maybe more so than a specific organization. Not that you can't have both, but um, that especially the larger the company, you know, if you have a global company, having a cause then allows different regions potentially to select a local charity or something that fits more um, than it might at another area. So for example, if your company is, if the headquarters is US centered, but you've got stores or employees or manufacturing plants, whatever in Europe, the, the same, com the same um, charitable organizations may not even exist over there. Um, and the causes might be different as well. So I don't know if either, if any of you have found um, a challenge in trying to to make something work for everyone in such large organizations or is it pretty easy to get people on board with the cause uh i'll take a stab at that i, I do think that's where it becomes really important to focus on a on a concept rather than that organization so jeremy you mentioned like hunger or you know food security which makes sense for us it's education that it does allow you to be involved in lots of different types of educational efforts and components and that kind of thing. We know that's going to make for a, uh, a better world, but how we, how that plays out in each of the different countries or even, you know, us cities might be totally different based on the needs there. I think from our standpoint, you know, the first thing we did is we took a look at, you know, who is our customer and what matters to our customer. And we very quickly, I mean, we've known the profile of our customer for a long time, our, con our, companies 55, 56 years young. Um, but we looked at what is it that our, that what is the makeup of the customer and what does she care about? And I say she, 
as the foreshadow of, of, you know, 80% of our shoppers are women. Um, you know, most 50 to 60% of them uh, have at least two children. And so we said, okay, look, if this is uh, where we're going to invest in the community uh, and give back to the people who are buying from us, which, you know, allow us uh, to flourish as a company and as individuals who, you know, lend our talents to the company, where can we invest in the things that matter to her? So we took a look at those things. We, we eventually went down the path of, okay, our, our customer, she cares about, you know, basic needs first and foremost, right? So we do support a few other things outside of basic needs, but we find ways to help tie them to those sort of four different areas of basic needs. But it was really for us based in, because as you get started, you know, you could spin your wheels. You're like, my goodness, where do we get started? As we try to, our whole thing was, how do we create a culture of philanthropy and leverage all of the different things that we can do as a company? So in-store, customers, um, associates around the country, not just in a corporate office or in our distribution centers, but how do we leverage all of those, right? How do we leverage merchandise? How do we leverage gift card spend? How do we look at all of this to create a culture of philanthropy? So we really rooted it first in that that information around who is our customer and what does she care about? And then let's go back and tie our philanthropy to the things that she's going to care about, because we're also going to ask her to get on board, right? So that when we, when we promote certain things in our stores, mental health, um, we do American Heart Association as a national um, cause partner for us. Um, the National Veterans Memorial Museum, right? Veterans are important um, to our customer and I think to all of us, uh, of course. But that's that's how we first took a look at it. Was we said, let's tie this to the customer. What is it that she cares about? And those are going to be the things that we care about. It's an interesting tie-in. Um from your friend and mine, Chuck Goes again. So first up, they're often inspired by the organizations that their customers support and then pass along our own corporate and employee support to those groups. That's it. It's a very clear tie-in, right? So if you don't have, um, well, everyone has a customer, but you know, J Jeremy's got a very clear retail customer that they know the, the identity of the, that marketing profile, so to speak. Um, if you have customers who are more like the client side of things or organizations, if you're B2B, what are, what's important to them? And is there a way that you can then spread um, some of that literal or figurative wealth um, to them as well? That's really interesting. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, I, as an internal communication professional, our customers are employees. So in some ways it's, it's almost crowdsourcing them for, um, different organizations. And I've already learned about three new organizations on this, this, um, this live chat. Um, so same thing can happen when you talk to your employees, because, you know, we as early warning, we have offices in the Bay Area, we're primarily headquarters in, um, in Arizona, and then we have an office in Chicago. But we also have a good amount of employees that are, are remote. So we always have to really keep them my, in mind. So when you do crowd, crowdsource all of your employees, then you might start having these organizations bubbled up that you never heard of that might be doing um, the same things that these other larger well-known organizations are doing. So I think that's, that's really important. I'm going to somewhat steal from what Chuck said, but just say, just talk to your customers, which should be your employees. Steal everything from Chuck, Ed. That's fine. We can. Okay. Yeah. No, it's fine. That's that's. I have your every... approval. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious. So on on that note, interestingly about um, that, and I think that's why there's such a clear link between internal comms and corporate philanthropy because who are the people that you are relying on to support this, to talk about it, to share information, to take part in events, all of that's your employees, right? And so that's that's where we become that link. And I think the, I, I'm sure we can all agree that, that that link then comes down to storytelling. Oh, now, now we've angered Chuck. He's upset <laughs> about that. <laughs> he has a Ms. Pac-Man machine actually in his office. So you can bond over Pac-Man uh, Pac-Man business things. Love it. Um, so, so Becky, I'm curious, you mentioned that you work with a team within HR and there's this philanthropy piece of it as well. Is there a challenge to figure out whose role is what, and also who, who takes on the storytelling part? Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely can. And then you throw, you know, the social team in, they're doing their job in capturing things. And so, yeah, sometimes we learn from one another. I mean, I guess, you know, it kind of comes down to the idea that there, you, there can't be too many stories about this, in my opinion. So if, if there's something great on social that 
we want to drag in house and put on, you know, on internal channels, we can do it and vice versa, pull from, for, pull from social. Um, but I think, you know, the other thing that, that I would, I wanted to add to what Ed was talking about too, and learning from your employees and getting those beautiful stories that come from being a part of something. I think, um, one of the things that we've learned is that even though you have a corporate cause, uh, this umbrella cause and concept, there's still some magic that happens when people volunteer for something that's really important to them personally. So finding a way to offer that balance and give employees some autonomy in where they um, want to spend their time and their volunteer efforts is equally important. And we want to tell those stories too. So where we kind of draw the line is the company is going to sponsor and support things that are around education, but for employee volunteer hours, you know, so they get 20 a year. Those can be um, directed toward any, any cause or program that, you know, meets the 501c3 criteria. So anything that's, you know, uh, is serving the community or, um, or other people. So I think that allows people to experience how great it feels to be a part of something bigger than themselves, that's always going to make us a better group of people, right? So, yeah, I, I think I think there's room for both. Jeremy, do you have any toe stepping that happens with your uh, small team and the intersections of everyone's roles? <laughs> you know what? I, I uh, yes and no. Like, there's I, there's a ton of toe stepping, but everyone's because we're together. There's no choice but to work together, right? There's no they all understand what the priority is. They all understand that every single day there's, you know, shifts in priorities. And if something big happened, that becomes the top news story and they need to get on that because they're producing the news of the company. So the, the there's a lot of that interconnectedness. Um, there's also an expectation that everybody on our team at least has a basic ability to write a post. So we're really big on communicating in sound bites, much like audiences are used to receiving news now, right? We read short news stories, we read push notifications, we can oftentimes pick up the gist of a story in three sentences, right, on an intro. And so people are very much trained that way. So we are using our internal platform uh, in order to do that. So we communicate in sound bites, a lot in photos with recognizing associates. So we see less of the feature writing and a lot more of here's a photo of something that took place. Here was the cause. This is why it was important to us. And maybe there's an associate quote or it comes directly from an associate. So um, there is an expectation that people also are we've democratized it and so because we're using a platform uh it's that's how i know chuck it's first up um we call ours the beat um you can go on the beat and look at that entire news feed um but you can self-publish just like you can on twitter or instagram you are empowered to share the stories of you know your individual contributions or your team contributions or things that you stand for as a leader uh news that's big and small right so we've we've worked hard to teach our associates what we expect to see on that platform right so there's not like crazy conversations around politics or hot topics in society but specifically around okay how does all this fit into uh our company's mission vision and values how does it fit into you know our tagline or our promise to our associates to inform um inspire and involve so we're asking hey how are you informing how are we inspiring people how are we involving people tell us those stories so um, there's still t there's there's toe stepping only because we're a small team and there's a lot happening. But we also have taken that and set an expectation of the business to say as leaders, people leaders, idea leaders, strategy leaders, or just everyday leaders and whatever your contribution is, we want you to share what's happening. Ed, I'm curious, and and Becky, feel free to jump in on this as well. Do you allow allow um, employees to post their own? stories of philanthropy or giving back or any kind of fundraising efforts that they do? Yeah, I think right now we're, we're trying to get our, um, our infrastructure set up very similar to what Jeremy mentioned uh, at Big Lots to have a forum where people are enabled. But a lot of times this is where myself as an internal communications person or our social media team, um, and as well as other people um, on our community impact team, we try to have frequent conversations with individuals. Usually we know when these organized activities are happening. So we try to have conversations with people like, hey, you're like, you're going, do you have a great story? Do you, do you want to tell your story? Because sometimes people don't, they want to keep it personal. But for the most part, 
people will want to. So then that's kind of when we step in, we enable them, we work with them, we determine what's the best format to share it. Um, their story, even though pictures tell, speaks a thousand words, I just completely butchered that. Um, <laughs> so at the end of the day, usually it doesn't need to be really long. It could be short and sweet with the image just to go along with it. Um, and that's all you need to do. Because really at the end of the day, our efforts um, is, are really meant to just inspire people to go out and do good on their own um, and just cause that domino effect, um, which hopefully will happen tomorrow on Giving Tuesday. Tuesdays in more than in more than many ways of just donating, just doing something nice for people uh, out in the community. Yep. And I will say Carrie Ann here is backing this up. Love to hear about employee empowerment on social media. That's an entire other live stream event, Carrie Ann, but you are absolutely right. We could talk about that for another hour. Uh, what a great way that is for employees to help build your brand and tell the story and all of those kinds of wonderful things. Um, okay. We have a question here and it's a very large question. Um, first, I'm going to give a little example here. Zahid's joining us. Zahid is my fellow Canadian. Hello, Zahid. How are you? Uh, previous company, we had a holiday promotion where employees could nominate their preferred local charities or organizations for 12 days of giving campaign. That's a cool way of like cool crowdsourcing. Cool. Yeah, I like that stealing idea. Stealing it. Stealing it, Zahid. We're all stealing all the ideas today. I love it. <laughs> stealing from Chuck. Stealing from yeah, Zahid. Yeah. <laughs> company held a draw, gave incremental sums to select charities. That's really cool. And then internally, they recognize the charity and the employee that nominated the charity. That's really, that's a great idea. And then people get that little feel good, like their charity was picked. That's really cool. Okay, here's the massive loaded question. Zane, we do not have a formal volunteer or nonprofit support program. Any thoughts on how and where to get started? So if we could just do this Staples easy button and just... You know, who has a one line answer to, to solve that problem? I'm just kidding. Um, so who who would like who's got a, a first thought about we have nothing and we don't know where to start? Because I guarantee you, Zane's not the only one who has this question. Yeah. If you don't mind, I'll start first. So go for it. We were in this exact same position at Big Lots. I've been with the company almost 16 years. When I started, part of their impetus to hire me was about building out philanthropy and how do we create this culture of philanthropy? So. We were kind of at zero. I'm not going to say the company wasn't doing anything, but they were doing next to nothing, to be fair, um, both in dollars, volunteer hours, et cetera. The way we got started before they ever gave a budget for any team, any type of production, any type of supplies was to just find people in this business who were champions for something that they cared about and then supported the hell out of them. So we would find someone who said, you know what? I love um, preparing meals at one of the shelters that takes care of families that, um, you know, are, are living on the land or currently without a home. Um, and so we said, great, how do we help you be a champion and own that particular cause and then get more people to follow you? Because if we can take your passion to lead people, then what will happen is you're going to start to share that feedback internally. You're going to be excited about it. You're going to own this. You're going to probably make it a recurring thing. Um, and then once that energy starts to take off, then other people will pay attention and be like, we need more of this. People are saying this is great. People want to have meaning in their work, especially when you look at younger generations, even our generation collectively ish on this call, right? It would put us all in that same category. Like people want their work to have meaning and it's beyond putting things on shelves or, you know, whatever your business specialty is. So when you empower people to own something, you get a lot farther. And by the way, that's a, that's someone who might have some time on the corner of their desk to dedicate. They're going to own this. They're going to be accountable for the success. Nothing's more powerful than when someone says to me, will you join me because I care about this? So we took that approach and just said, look, I have no money. I have no team. Uh, we're starting to build a strategy, but what I need first is just the people to, to go out and do more volunteerism and prove that this is the right path. And once we got that started, then it started to take off. And then people started saying, we need to do more of this. We need to be giving more to these organizations. What do you need from us? That opened a door for us. My next step was find the champions with chief in their title or some sort of senior in their title. Find those one or two champions who are crazy about some cause and just doing philanthropy. And when they show up, that's to a volunteer event or to help you present something or speak, it's a powerful moment because that is peer to peer for the people who are making those decisions, right? So. First, find the champion locally, just do some of the work. And then when they come back, have them talk about it, share that information, get excited, um, then find your champions, uh, I think internally, 
um, to then help you prepare like, you know, the, the, the actual strategic stuff around what do we care about? What are we going to prioritize? Where does this budget come from? How do we leverage all of the different assets of what we do? The customers, the associates, our, our physical buildings, our ability to, you know, give visibility to causes in store to our customers through, you know, digital advertising, et cetera. So that's how we started. And it, it, it started just, you know, that snowball just picked up more snow as it rolled downhill. And now as a, you know, we're doing $20 million of philanthropic activity a year, 10 million of that's coming from our customers. The other 10 million is a combination between cash, merchandise, in-kind, uh, gift cards, et cetera, that all adds up. So um, we're a much different organization today than we were before. And it's because we started small and just said, how do we find people who care and then help empower them to start building this incredible, you know, uh, not only the journey, but the excitement. If retail organizations in 2022 can do many, 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 many millions of dollars in charity work, all of you can, yeah. not this call, I'm saying all of us can also commit to that. I, will, I want to highlight one point, then I want to hear from Ed and Becky about where to get started. When you mentioned, you know, having the C-suite people or the senior people involved in philanthropic efforts, you know, I'm imagining, okay, let's say you're doing a Habitat for Humanity build or something like that. You, that's, it's, these, these events and these fundraising and philanthropy efforts are very unique and rare opportunities for seniority levels to be flattened. Like th there are many people, we are uh, fortunate in many ways in working in internal comms where we have access often to those leadership roles and those people. Most people at large companies do not. So how cool would it be to, to be, you know, slinging a hammer beside the CEO? Like that's a really cool opportunity for a lot of people. And that's a, I think that's a, maybe an overlooked part of the philanthropy efforts. And now I've side railed. But anyway, uh, Ed and Becky, do you have uh, some tips for Zane about getting, or other people as well, about getting started when you've got, when you're starting at ground zero? Yeah, I can, I can jump in if that's okay, Becky. Um, I think Jeremy really hit on it. Um, he, he mentioned partnering with C-suite individuals, but first off, just partnership. So it would be ideal to connect or become really good friends if you haven't done so already with your chief people officer, chief human resource officer. Um, I know a lot of individuals and internal comms might already funnel into that, that person, but partnering with them where you now have an advocate, um, another great um, pool of people to partner with if you don't have like a formal volunteer program where like Becky, they have um, volunteer hours allocated each month. We do too at early warning. If you don't have that in place, you can simply work with your leaders, your your um, managers, your people leaders to say like, hey, instead of doing a sit down meeting where everyone comes in virtually or in person and you're going to talk about business, why don't you just take a break on that for one day? And why don't you go to like a food bank? Feeding in America is one food bank that I love because we're based in the U.S. and they're they're everywhere. There's a food bank in every metropolitan city where, and it doesn't take more than an hour. You you meet there, you pack some boxes, you hand out some food. It's it's such a great feeling like afterwards. So, this is a way like if you don't have allocated hours that employees can do it on their own, just work with your people leaders to just morph a, a meeting into that. I mean, it, it's going to make so much more of a difference, I think, to bring the team together and just having everyone just do something for good together. Um, that's a phenomenal idea. I think that's, that should be the task and challenge for everyone who is on this call is to, and then joining us, is to make a point of taking a standing meeting and doing something philanthropic with it, doing yeah. something to give back. That's a fantastic idea. Or that's if you've good. got like team building activities, incorporate something more meaningful into that team building activity. That's a great way to test the waters and start out with things. I yeah, love I'm that. Like I love start start by doing rather than by talking about it. But um, a couple other ideas that I would add to what these guys suggested, which I think are great, is um, first of all, I think this can be something that is employee led from as an as a beginning initiative to bring that to leadership rather than having it come down from leadership. I think it just has a totally different feel 
So if you can get a focus group together of people who express interest or you, you know are already very active to say, we look, we don't have a, a formal volunteer program, but we recognize the importance of one. What would it need to include for it to feel valuable and inspiring to you? Would that be so many hours per year that you're allowed time off? Would that be something built around uh, teams getting involved? Would that be um, some sort of matching, um, you know, gift type of program or whatever that might be? So I think helping you know helping pull employees together to get their thoughts around that initially, and then take your pitch to those seniors senior leaders like you're talking about. But I think part of that conversation also has to revolve around where is that intersection between what the community needs or the world in which you serve, whatever that is, could be globally, it could just be, you know, start headquarters or something of that nature, but find out where that intersection is between need and what your company can provide and what your company needs to get out of this. I mean, we, you know, this can't just be um, just for fun. This, this needs to be what, how are we going to grow from this as a company? What do we want? What can we give back? What can we put on the table? In our case, we can put free software in the hands of people who are attempting to learn analytics and pull themselves up. That's something we have to offer. Not, But thinking about what your company has that's unique to offer, I think is a big piece of it in taking that pitch to leadership to say, Here, here's, here's a great match. You know, here's that great intersection. And that's a great point as well, given the economic state of the world at this point, that um, there might be sensitivity to cash, right, and donations, but there are always things in your organization that you can give that are not cash, right, that are either intangible or very tangible, um, but not so it was a silly example, but um, a lot of nonprofit organizations would love to have use of boardrooms and office space. A lot of nonprofits would love to have event space. Maybe your company headquarters has physical space that for, you know, a one-time thing or that, you know, maybe their board meetings can be in your office. Those kinds of things make a big, big impact um, and don't require cash. Jeremy, I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot. And if you can't talk about it, you just tell me you can't talk about it and we'll pretend I never said anything. <laughs> you did a, 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 philanthropic uh, donation that involved product recently that you and I talked about. Can you, sh can you give that as an example? Is that allowed? Yeah, we can absolutely talk about okay. it. Um, our team has put some things out on LinkedIn. I always am like, I, I'm a little bit old school in the way that I want this story to first be shared internally, but people are so excited about this stuff that they want to share it on social media. I've seen it on Instagram. I've seen it on Facebook and I also see it on LinkedIn. We work with Make-A-Wish. Um, you know, and I would say we grant one or two make a wish, uh, wishes a year. Um, and it's, you know, it's oftentimes a room makeover or a backyard makeover or something where a kid wants a certain experience. And in this case, there was a young girl who's just, uh, dynamite, super smart, um, just a loving young girl. She's got a, gen a very rare genetic disorder that will leave her without sight in a couple of years. And so, uh, she wanted her basement to be made over into a, uh, princess castle, um, complete with, you know, a slide that goes down and drops into a ball pit, um, you know, a bunch of uh, dresses for a princess, all the, t all the types of, uh, you know, costume jewelry accessories, but also other things that, you know, uh, she could interact with. Um, and I'm trying to think of the activity board they use, but it helps with sensory um, awareness and sensory uh, activation so that um, as she continues to lose her eyesight or maybe when it's gone uh, she's got other things that um, help her to begin to transition into what that will look like for her and how she navigates um, with different abilities um, going forward so um, an incredible opportunity i mean we that request came in and anytime we get a request for furniture for some project or something there's an entire team of people who jump at the chance to do this so our marketing team happened to jump at this one and said we're going to 80% of the stuff that's in that room is going to be, you know, merchandise that we offer to our customers with everyday fantastic values. Um, and the rest of it's just going to be fun stuff that we gather and that we create as a team. So they jumped on this. It was an absolutely incredible, um, an absolutely incredible um, transformation 
Uh, and once we get past our quarterly town hall on Monday, then I'll probably share that video externally because we did a whole story on this, right? Oh, that's even uh, cooler. I didn't know there was a video. I've seen the pictures that some people have shared. And I was like, I this forbid is... them from sharing the video. <laughs> 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 I said, not until our own people see it. I mean, this was <laughs> incredible because it was people not just in this corporate space, but it were store associates. It were store, store or excuse me, associates from our distribution center, fulfillment center for e-com. Um, just a great collaboration. Um, the challenge I gave to my team was, it's cool that we're doing this, but how are we telling the story? This is one of those yeah. bigger feel good feature stories. So this one was about, you know, doing the interviews and, and following the story and the production. And, um, you know, how did we put our skill sets and our, our knowledge as a business to use uh, in making the story come to life? And I think when you get to know the organizations that you're supporting, this was one of the other tips that came from our call last week with our fundraising expert friend. Um, that was one of his his strong suggestions was really get to know the cause, but also the specific organization and what they need, because there are some organizations who are like, we really need cash. Like that is our number one thing. Sure. We need, we need money. There are other organizations, like I said, who are like, actually, we would really love space or we would really love backpacks or we would, you know, whatever that is. Um, you know, I've, I volunteer at a, our city shelter or animal shelter and people love to donate like stuffed toys and, and, and sweaters for dogs, which are adorable. But we, what we really need is like dog food and, sure. and peanut butter and spray cheese. You know what I mean? There, there's, it's, there's the feel good things that people like to donate. And then there's also like, oh, if they had asked us, we could have been like, do a peanut butter drive. We would love that. That would be amazing. Well, and I think you highlight a great point that I often try to drive home to our leaders and to our own associates that philanthropy is not just about the feel good for us. There's the educational component of, yes, there's the heartstrings, but how do you connect people to understanding and identifying community needs it's not just because we want to feel good G generosity is like a natural should be a natural extension of who you are as a person if that's something you value but it's also about exposing people to things that maybe they're afraid of or exposing people to things that they've never had a chance to learn about or maybe you know in life they've never had to be exposed because they didn't grow up around fill in the blank whatever might be in that blank so i think that's where if you want to connect to the communications piece on this the power is in communicators uh, or those that we tap to help us with comms is to find those stories, right? So if Becky is a colleague of mine or Ed is at that you know event and they're working alongside me, I'm just going to pick up a conversation and be like, Ed, why did you decide to sign up, right? Then Ed starts a conversation with me. Then I say, Ed, well, what does this mean to you? And Ed says, oh my gosh, well, I have kids. And you know what? If, I, if this were my kid and da, da, da. Or hey, Becky says, gosh, I've never volunteered with this organization, I was kind of curious. And then I started asking her, well, why do you care about volunteering? Suddenly I have a story and then I'll ask her later, hey, you know, you just shared some great stuff with me. I would love to just share that on a really quick post because to me, it's not, the story is not that we're doing the activity. The story is in why do people care and what impact are we having? So I like to find those Beckys and those Eds and those Zahids and the Zanes and sometimes even the Chuck Doses of the world. Sometimes, or, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. And find out what is it that they care about? Why is it meaningful to them? That's the story I'm going to share because it matters to our associates. And when you highlight, you know, what's in their heart, I feel like that's the really compelling stuff. Yeah. So much more genuine. I mean, it's, and I think that's what we always do with as internal comps professionals. Like usually we're, we're speaking on behalf of the executive and the leadership team. Um, but how do you human, humanize it? And, and I know we, we do that with our leaders, our people leaders to say, hey, like they're humans, like beyond their day to day job. But same thing like with employees, like you just connect with it more. And I'm sure like I've listened to five audio books about like how to make stories come to life and you make that personal connection like that's it just triggers something in people's brain that it just resonates more and it's not just something that they gloss over. They'll remember it and hopefully it will inspire them to do the same thing or just untap something that they've been wanting to do for so long, but time and life gets in a way that they're like, oh, we'll do it later. No, do it now. Make 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 good today and make, make a difference in someone else's life like right now. 
And, and to that point of, of telling the story in new and creative ways, sometimes that even happens well before the event. So I'll share one example that we did this year because we support education and, and back to school time. You know, it, that's always the time when people want to do back to school supply drives. So we put our interns on finding out from Wake County teachers, which is where our headquarters is located, Wake County teachers, what they really needed. What are the top five school supplies that they really need versus what people want to buy for them? So they did all this analysis ahead of time. They set up their own code and everything to run this analysis in this program. And they came out with the top five things that Wake County teachers really need. So we built up the anticipation to the supply drive by doing what we feel like we do well, you know, and it made the, you know, the bins that we gathered around campus or the things that we set up a wish list for on Amazon to say, these are the five things that we're looking for so that we can serve our teachers best. So it was fun. I mean, it was, it was tied it, you know, into like a way that we could tell it and do a school supply drive in our way. I love the, the developing code for us. Like that's such a SAS thing to do. Like, Oh, by the way, we're also just going to write the back end code for this entire program <laughs> to get the information for exactly. it. And it was fun because it was our stuff. interns too. So it like gave them something to come together on around yeah. this. So that was a cool aspect of it too. I think if anything from this conversation, one of the things I've, I'm taking away from it is that you if you're looking at it like, well, we need to work on our employee engagement so that we can develop a corporate philanthropy program, actually the philanthropy can fuel the engagement. And I um, look at I'm getting thumbs up from people. Uh, I love it. Yeah. But I, you know, and I, I will admit I've never I've never worked at a company truly that's large enough to have something like that. And actually I was usually at companies that were the receiving end of corporate philanthropy um at nonprofits. But that's I think that's the that's the takeaway everyone I think should have is that if you are struggling with engagement, try the philanthropy aspect, try getting people together and rallying them around a cause um, that can, that will fuel in itself an entire piece of engagement. So I got points with Very Jeremy true. today. So Very true. <laughs> that's so true. And if you think about it, building culture, and that's what we all focus on building culture is everyone's responsibility. It, yes, it comes from the top and that's where you should see great some of your greatest examples, but not all your examples, right? This is about how we all treat each other. It's about how we all look out for each other. It's about how we all lift each other up. And so culture is what every single one of us do to contribute on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would like to know in our last six minutes, I would like to know if any of you have something that has stood out over the years that somehow was a corporate, um, a philanthropic effort that you worked on corporately that was something that just really stuck with you. And in the meantime, I will share the quote of the day from Chuck Ghost. Philanthropy can be a healthy distraction from the sucky parts at work. <laughs> true. Very true. Well, that is, it's not, it's not incorrect. Touche. So. <laughs> Does anyone have, have a, a magic moment that they that will be just forever etched in their brain from something cool that they did corporately or anyone in the chat, anyone who's joining us, if you have something that's, that was an extra special moment. I'll share an example of something we did a few giving Tuesdays back um, for giving Tuesday. We kind of step outside of the education realm and we just try to do several local um, organizations. One of which is our food bank, local food bank. So we had an executive cook off. And we teamed up, so we had um, pairs of executives in, it, in each of the cafes that provided one of their family's recipes. And they served this recipe in kind of a little, I don't know, a tasting. It wasn't a whole lot. But in order to do the tasting, you had to bring a canned food or donate a dollar. And uh, so that raised money for the food bank. And then um, exact, once you paid your dollar, paid your can, you'd get the tastings. And then you could vote on who's ex which executive's dish was the best. So there was an online voting element, which got people involved too, which was a lot of fun. But I think the biggest part about it was having executives serving employees in a way that they're not used to seeing them. So interacting in a way that felt very different from day to day. That's the definition of servant leadership. I hope somebody made a dad joke about that at some <laughs> point. Like serving employees, servant leadership. Lovely. Might be in here.
It's probably, oh. do you have a dad jokes book handy? That's oh phenomenal. <laughs> oh my gosh. My wife and my son did not want me to buy it, but I'm like, you, you want had me to, to. Come? you want better material. So um, you had to, you absolutely so had to. It makes me smile every day. Um, <laughs> One example I have, and this, before internal communications, I did ten years of social media management for um, for for different companies, and and for um, I always remember um, a data storage company in Silicon Valley that I used to um, manage social media for. Every year they would have um, an annual event um, where they partner with St. Baldrick's, and if you don't know what St. Baldrick's is, it's um, a company that um, raises money for awareness. Um, for kids with cancer. So what happens is usually they'll have a head shaving party. You'll, you'll raise money. And then at the end of it, individuals will come up and they'll have their locks just everywhere. Like I, I have nothing. Um, but it'll be an event where people will shave their hair, their hair and give their hair for um, charity and then just raise money. But um, there's one instance where there was um, an employee and their, 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 their child was actually um, recently diagnosed with cancer. And so, you know, a whole, the whole team came together for, um, that individual and you had, you had the kid there and you had the parent there and it was just such a touching, um, moment to, to see that parent just going through that moment, that child there, but the team rallying together for their, their coworker, not only by raising money, but, but shaving off, um, their, their hair and just, it just was priceless, just the tears, the raw emotion there, but just how that work community came together, not only for all children with um, childhood cancer, but for that, that one child. That's a powerful moment. And to Carrie, Carrie Ann's point here, philanthropy can fuel employee engagement. Absolutely, it can. I will uh, leave everyone with two very important points. Uh, the first is... Tomorrow, as we've mentioned a number of times, is Giving Tuesday. So please consider how you might make someone's day better tomorrow. Well, every day, let's consider that, but especially tomorrow. Uh, but that also, but and also, there are needs that need to be filled all year round. And so if tomorrow is a special day where you can go above and beyond, please do that and try and keep some semblance of that giving mentality throughout the year. Um, there are lots of organizations that of course see their donations dramatically increase this time of year. People are feeling particularly uh, generous, which is amazing. And also that we, they need those, they need that support in February and June as well. So let's keep that momentum going. And I will end, this is our, our theme for this month in ecology was living generously. And I, I, we've lived that in many ways this month. And I will leave with gratitude uh, for that, for all three of you for joining me today, for being stewards of generosity in your own communities and in your workplaces. I am so grateful. Let's all cry now. I am so grateful for our industry. We've seen a lot of people come together in the last few weeks, especially, um, it's been a it's it's been a tough year for a lot of people in our industry, and for people in our communities. And so, thank you to all three of you for being part of all of that. So, have a wonderful week. Have a wonderful Giving Tuesday. Thank you, everyone. This is our last Ecology Presents of the year. We've got a fun event uh, that we're going to plan in December. Um, but until then, we will see you all. Uh, in all of the generous places in our community. So thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Kristen. Bye. Bye. Thank you.